Good morning. We'll be starting shortly. Let's check that microphone. It sounds a little garbly today. Welcome to another episode of Microcontrollers with Kinger North. This is episode six. Welcome to another episode of... Today we're going to talk about random numbers and timers and with CircuitPython and Arduino. So let's shut off our starting... ...started now. Here we are. It is another wonderful day here. We're going to talk about uh, random numbers and timers with CircuitPython and Arduino. We're going to do both again. And let's move on to our main page, actually. And here we go. So we're going to look at a number of boards today. Today we have three different boards that we're going to be using. I'm going to be doing it first with Arduino. And then I'm going to be moving on to CircuitPython. And then I'm going to show you a much larger example to show you what can be done with it. So let's have a quick look at the board that we're using here. So up here in the top left, we can see our standard Feather M4 Express from Adafruit. This is our CircuitPython board. This is the one I'll be connecting to when I'm doing the CircuitPython portion of the programming. And we'll see how that works with both the random numbers and the timers. Down here, we have a standard Uno board. This is actually not made by Arduino, but it is an Arduino compatible. It is fully pin compatible. It's identical layout. The difference is this one uses the uh, CH340 chip to communicate over the USB here. So that's the only difference over the normal one. It's also a 16 megahertz board. We're going to use it uh, just because we don't need any other peripherals with it today when we're doing our actual learning. And this is where we're going to spend most of our time is with this board. So we'll go over that board in more detail shortly. This third board that we have, this is the first time I'm using this one on these streams, and this is the Metro M4 Grand Central. This is also from Adafruit. This said beta edition. They have now released a more uh, usable edition. This has got the same footprint, so in other words, the same exact pin layouts all around the outside as the Arduino Mega. If you look at it closely, you'll see that the first from here to here is actually the same as from here to here pin layout. So anything that plugs into this here, they have what they call shields that plug into the, these Unos. You can plug it into the top of a Metro M4 Grand, Grand Essential or an Arduino Mega. And this has got the same pin out. Now this here we'll be doing it in the circuit python today i'll be showing you with circuit python code running in it but this board from adafruit could just as easily be programmed with arduino it's actually capable of doing both there are some major differences one it has a, an sd a micro sd card holder here so you can actually insert a, a micro sd card holder it actually has an on off switch on the side which uh, is not included on an, on an arduino board the chip is a much larger M4 processor from Atmel, same company that makes the chips for the Arduino. Just a much more powerful and much faster. This one, I believe, runs at 120 megahertz instead of 16. It also has a memory chip down in here, and this is an 8 megabyte memory chip, so SP, uh, SPI memory, so QSPI, I believe they refer to it as. Basically, this is like a file holder or a, a drive 
on board. So we can actually store much more files in it. Very handy when you're getting into the purpose of using uh, something like Circuit Python. It allows you to store a lot more files in here. It allows you to store audio files, uh, images, that kind of thing that can be used with peripherals connected to this. It has more capacity than what you're going to find on your standard Uno board. It also has 256K of memory on this, which is very large for a microprocessor. But we'll come back to this one afterwards. It's already pre-wired. I'll talk about the wiring that I have here. I actually had kind of color coded to what I'm doing, but uh, we'll go over that in more detail later on. So let me move that one out of the way. So we're just going to take that, move it off to the side. We're going to take our feather board and we're going to move it up out of now and this is going to be the one we're going to concentrate on so i'm going to start by just plugging it in this is going to be so exciting because all we're going to do is we're going to see it kind of lit up here so we're just going to plop that in here and what we'll do is we'll go back to our main screen and then we'll zoom in so as you can see it's actually a much smaller footprint today so let's zoom in a couple of times and we'll move in on here. And I'm getting a little bit of glare off the camera on its own. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off its own light. Actually, it's got its own light on the camera. We're just going to turn it on here and use all my extra lighting around here. I'll show you some of the features of this board that vary from a standard Arduino version of this. Like the standard one from Arduino, we use the same connector on it. We use the USB. It's a USB style connector. So it's a USB-B, which is pretty normal. It's got our regular power jack here, which we can put in DC power into. Voltage regulator on board to bring that down to the proper voltage. This chip here is a little different than the regular Arduino. This is the one that talks with the, this is a USB communications chip. This converts the signal from the USB to an RS-232 that the rest of the, the processor can understand. The silver piece beside it is a 12 megahertz crystal that talks over the USB that sets the frequency and everything so the timing is right there. This is the processor chip. This is a 328 just like from Atmel. Just like the long chip except this is in a much smaller surface mount package. This is the 16 megahertz crystal that sets it to 16 megahertz. And the rest of this, the pin layouts are identical to what you would find on the Uno from Arduino itself. So other than that, it looks the same. So it works identical to the ones you're used to. It's just slightly different packaging. So let's have a look at our Arduino window and let's get started here. So let me just find that in here and we'll open that up. And here we go. So this is our standard Arduino window. I've already opened this, but I haven't saved anything yet. I've opened this up and this is our default sketch for today. It's called Sketch May 09A. And we're going to update that in a moment. Good morning, Walter. Welcome aboard. Nice to see you here. So let's go through this. And the first thing I'm going to do with this is I'm going to go and I'm going to create a file, save as, because I want to give this a name and I want to give it a location. So I'm going to go file, save as. It's going to pull up the window. We're going to go in here. It's going to put it in my Arduino folder by default. For my sake here today, I'm going to put this into my documents and I'm going to put this into my electronic show. I have one here for episode six timers in random. Now I already have some random files in here, so I have to give it a new name. So I'm going to come down here to the bottom of the window and I'm going to give it a name and I'm going to call it random. As soon as I learn how to spell random. Okay, and this is going to be random Arduino. So we're just going to do that to get it started. And we can now see here that it has saved the name Random Arduino on our page. This is just a standard blank sketch. So let's create a couple of spaces here at the top. And I'd like to start out with a comment. I'm going to do a multi-line comment. So I'm just going to start out by using the opening measure that allows us to start a comment. I'm just going to go up here and I'm going to go, this is, uh, let's see, Random and timer functions on an UNO. Okay, and this will be, of course, by King or North. That's me. 
So we're just going to start out with a standard comment. As I hit return, we'll see that that actually brings me down to the next line and, line and it continues my comment for me. Very handy when you're going to do a multi-line comment. So this one here is, we're going to talk about random numbers. And we're going to put in a note about that. And I'm going to come down here and I'm going to put in one called timers. And we're going to add more to these notes as we go along here because I'm going to talk about what's happening inside of here. So we're going to move down into the top of the program now. So we've actually gone through, created a, a basic comment that we can work with and we can save with the files so for our own use later on. And now we'll move into here and we have to put in all our include files. This is where we would include things. When we did the servo, we had to include servo.h. Well, there are no add-on files for when we're using random numbers or timers with the Arduino Uno. So we're not gonna put any helper files up here at all. We're gonna leave that part blank. So I'm just gonna bring down one line just to give me a space. And the next thing I wanna do is I'm gonna have to put in any information that I'm going to need as far as setting up parameters or variables within here. And I am gonna set up one parameter and I'm gonna set up one parameter. I'm gonna use the, the term long. Now this is something new that we've done. And in the past, I've used integer in here, INT, when I wanted to create a number that was an integer. An integer is basically a variable that goes from negative 32,000, um, seven, uh, 768 to positive 32,767. Basically, it's a signed 16 bit number. Well, built-in feature of the Uno operate of the Arduino operating system of the operating IDE so what we're going to do is this they've defined it as a long variable now a long variable is slightly bigger so a long is actually a 32-bit number so it actually goes from minus two point something billion to plus two point something billion it's a very very big number and there's a reason for that, and that is because we're going to be using it, and random numbers can be very, very large, and they want lots of bits in there to become random as possible. So they define the variable type. I don't have a choice over that. It's being used within the internal built-in feature, so we're gonna go ahead and use it. So we're just gonna use long, and I'm just gonna create something called rand number. And this will just be a variable that I'll use to store my random number that we generate today. So I've created that variable that I've needed in here. Now, the next thing we need to do is we're going to go in here and I'm gonna highlight this comment because I'm gonna get rid of it. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up, the, um, I wanna be able to use the serial monitor so I can see what's happening. I don't have any lights connected. Today, I don't have any push buttons connected or anything like that. I've got no servos, nothing that's gonna show us on the board what's gonna happen. So I need to show it in my code. So what I want to do is I want to open up, I want you to be able to use the serial monitor so I can get feedback from the board while it's running and we'll see what we can do with that. So I'm going to put in here my serial.begin and I'm going to set the baud rate for that. So I'm going to set it to 9600, which is pretty standard for most of the things that you're going to do. You can speed it up, but there's no need to at this point. So I'm just going to move over here a little bit and I'm going to put in a comment and it's just going to be to talk to the serial monitor. And that's really what we're putting that in there. That's just a starting point to allow us to talk to it. We'll move down to the next line and we're not gonna put anything else in here now, but we will later and I'll show you why when we get to it. But we're gonna go down to our main loop now. So our main loop is gonna set up and it's gonna work out pretty good. So we're just gonna come down because the first thing we want to do is we want to be able to generate a random number. And I'm going to show you how easy it is to actually create a random number in, in using the Arduino language. It is actually very simple, but there's some problems with it, and we'll talk about what those are. So I'm just going to use my variable that I created, random number. And I'm going to make that equal to a function that's built into Arduino that's called random. And then all I have to do is put in a minimum and a maximum number that I need for the range. So I'm going to go from 0, comma, and I'm going to go to 100. And I'm just going to say, close the end of that. 
So what is this going to do? This is going to do nothing more than generate a random number. So there we go. So that's what we've done. So we're going to just generate a random number. Now I know that went slightly off the page, but that's okay. That's just the comment. We can actually scroll over that if we really needed it. The next thing we want to do is we want to take this number and we want to display it. So we're going to display it using the serial monitor. So we're going to start out with serial.print. Now this is starting to look pretty simple at this point for creating a random number. And in reality it is. And I'm actually going to use print ln because I want to do everything on a new line. And we're just going to print the, the, the answer, ran number. It's pretty straightforward at this point. So far, our code is not very daunting. It's actually pretty simple code. Audio is rough today. I don't know what's going on with that, Walter. Let me unplug my microphone and we'll see if that improves a little bit. Okay, Walter, is that any better? I am going to have to count on you. I thought it had cleared up when I, after I started, but maybe it didn't. Is that working any better? There's one other possibility here. Okay, Walter, let's try this. I think I know what might have happened, and it was my fault for the way I set it up. Is this better now? You're going to have to tell me. And the way I set it up. Is this better now? I'm going to wait for your reply. What I had to do today that was a little different, I had to set up this image in the bottom left-hand corner, and when I did, I don't think I turned the microphone off. And I might have done that on my other page too, so if I switch back to it, I'll have to do it as well. I don't know if I'm going to get a thumb or what from Walter now, but hopefully that fixed the audio. I think I might have had two microphones picking up the sound at the same time. That's always nasty when that happens. Okay, so hopefully that's fixed everything. I'm not sure if it has or not. I'd hate to have to do this again, but I guess I could if it really came down to it. So what I was just saying here is we're going to print a serial number. So basically this was pretty simple. And this is simply to display the number. So that's all that's going to do in there. So if we did this right... Hopefully, with any luck, we're going to see something happen. But it's going to be going by and streaming by really quick. So there's one more feature I want to add. No audio. Well, what's happened here? Okay. okay. Oh, that's mine. That could be working. Oh, we have technical difficulties here. Oh, we have technical difficulties here. Oh, it is messy today, isn't it? Oh, it is messy today, isn't it? Now, let me see what happens here. I'm going to try something. This is going to be interesting. Let me uh, just mute for a second here and see if we can't clean this up. Okay. Ooh, 
That's noisy. Now, let's see if that's working any better at all. Can we tell? Now, let's see if that's working any better at all. Can we tell? I think it might be. Well, I know there's the latency problem of uh, waiting to hear it. Oh, it sounds better. Okay, so I don't know. That was weird. I had to change the settings around quite a bit, but uh, we'll see what happens. Anyways, we'll go from here. So what I was talking about here was in my program, I created a long random number. The reason for that is because the built-in function requires it to be long, a 32-bit number. So we're using a 32-bit number today. Added serial begin, so it actually talks to the serial monitor. And then in the void loop, what I've done here in the main program is I'm generating a number from 0 to 100. And I'm going to print that number on the serial monitor, which we will display when we get there. So right now, I'm going to go ahead and pick my board. Since we seem to be working at the moment, I'm not going to push it any further. And we're going to set it up. Now it says it's on 0 port 1, which is not correct because it's not turned on. Let me plug that back in again. and. Oh, I hate when things start happening like this. This is going to be one of those days. All right. There we go. We got, we're zoomed back in on here. I can see this now, one of these days. You can see now here we've added COM port 3 because I plugged in my board. So for some reason, things aren't being happy today. We're going to have to work our way through these these defaults and figure it out so we're going to make sure it's on com3 which it says it is and everything should be good we can validate our code we're going to check that it says it's okay so we're going to go ahead and upload that and it says it's done compiling so let me open up my serial monitor and bring that over into the screen so we can see what's happening here so i'm just going to move that over here to the edge so you can see what's happening here so right now, what's happening is we are generating numbers. And if I press the reset button on the board, we're going to see that it's going to reboot and we're going to start producing new numbers down here. Okay, I can clear the output in between. So let me just do that. Clear the output. We'll get the new start. It started. If I press reset again, I press that again, it starts with 67. And I'm gonna press it again. This should be the new number. And it started with 81. So it seems to be taking random numbers. Yeah, I'm earning my money today. I'll tell you, some days these things, you just gotta work your way through these problems and figure out what's going on. Technical issues. But we can actually see that our board is working. We have a slight flicker here. If I cover it up, you can see the little light is flashing on here the little leds so it is transmitting a, a value every one second setting it as fast as i can what i didn't do is i didn't add my delay so let me add a delay in here just to keep it from trying to overwork itself and we're going to do it once a second that's probably a good thing to do i will go ahead and upload that we'll have a look at the serial monitor and when it's finished it will just start strolling and there we are it did it at seven i press my reset again new number will come out here at the bottom and it started at seven ah this is what we wanted to show new number is going to come out at the bottom right now let's see what do we get and we get seven isn't that amazing for a random number generator we are actually seeing the same number start each time let's do that one more time i'm going to press reset so what comes next seven 
If you notice, we had the same number come up every time. This is something that is going to haunt you when you're doing random numbers. Random number generators on microcontrollers, and it's just not the Arduino, it's all microcontrollers, is not a true random number. It's what they refer to as pseudo-random. So what happens is, is there's actually a long chart that's been saved to generate what looks like a random number, but it's really not. In fact, I'll show you again, I'll press reset once more. We can come down here to the bottom, I'll press it down. The next number up, hey, look at that, it was seven again. It's predictable. I could win the lottery if I had this type of num random number generator, but that's not the case. What happens is to get true random, we need a much bigger logarithm in the background running, something that is just not capable in the size of these microcontrollers. So they created this pseudo, pseudo random. Now, this is a big long list and it starts with the first bit and it goes to the next one, goes to the next one, goes to the next one. So the reason why it, it, looks, it looks random is because you probably don't remember the sequence. Prove it again, I'll press the button again. The next one comes up as a seven. It starts with a seven and goes to a 49. Let's see if I do that again. It starts with a seven, goes to a 49, then a 73. Let's do it again. It'll be a seven, a 49, a 73. Look at that, it's a pattern. It is actually a remembered set of numbers. So what happens is it's a limited amount of math because they only have so much memory to play with. So what we do is we can add another function in here. They created another function that helps it look a little more random. And how it does that is this new command that I'm going to add now to the code is something that just tells it where to start in the list the first time to pick a number. After that, the pattern does repeat. So if you could remember the first thousand steps that come out in this, once you figure out where you are in the pattern, you could probably repeat it again. So this is what happens. So up here, what they're gonna do in the void setup is we're gonna add another command. And this is part of the random stuff that's in there. And we're gonna call this one random seed. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna tie it <clears throat> Pardon me, I need to get a drink here after all that fixing of the audio. What we're going to do is we're going to go here to random seed and we're going to pick up an analog input. So what we're going to do is we're going to hang analog read. And what we're going to read is one of the unused analog bits. So on this side here, we have six analog bits that aren't being used. Well, we're going to go ahead and I know fun day today. It's going to be a zero. So we're just going to pick the first one that's available to us and we're just going to call it a zero. So this is a function and that what this is going to do, and I'll put in a comment here and this is going to be the starting point for our random numbers. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this. I'm going to have a look at that numbers again and it did start with a seven on the first run through but let me press it again and see if it starts with seven again it did hmm imagine that and we got the same pattern showing up if i press it i show seven but watch what happens here and what i'm going to do is i'm going to grab myself a wire and I'm going to connect it to A0. And I'm just going to take it and let it hang there to the side. It's actually, if you want to see, it's not connected to anything. It's just open in free air, preferably not touching anything. And let's see if it changes the result. I'm going to press the button. Oh, it started with zero again. Usually the way this works. Uh oh. You know why? Because something's missing here. What does it say? Ha! Ah, we're not actually looking at it. Let's put the double bracket in here. Let's save this. Actually showed as an error. When I do that and I bring it up, what's my first number going to be? Ah, I was 18 that time. That's better. And I'll explain what's going on here. 
So I'll press it again. What's the first number going to be where my arrow is? 56. Press it again. 26. I'm now creating what looks like a random number. This is ideally how it works. Is when we do this, is I'm adding in A0. A0 is an analog value. And analog values, unless you ground them, what happens on an analog input, it picks up static in the air and it will change depending on the moisture in the air, how much static there is, how dry the air is, and everything else. And it will actually affect what it looks like. So we're actually going to cause different issues that go on here with this random number. So it'll change it. So if I press it again, the new number is going to show up at the bottom, 93. <clears throat> It now makes it very, very hard to predict. You would have, a, have to have a long list of numbers, and after the first few numbers, you might be able to find the spot in there where the values actually start to repeat. But it's very hard, so now it looks like a true random number, and it's pretty close to being true random. I wouldn't want to uh, do any encrypting with this method of randomness because it's not truly a random number, but at least it gets us closer. And for most things that we're going to produce, most of our projects, this will produce a fairly decent random number. So I think we're okay with that. So what's gonna happen is that's what we're gonna do right now. And we can actually make this better and better and better, and we can improve this program, and we're going to make a couple of changes to it. But as we can see, very simply, we created a random number generator. Pretty nice little system to do. And it wasn't that hard in the end. We just had to add this extra comment here called random seed and read an analog that we are not using. Now, what I was going to do with the wire there, sometimes if you put out the wire, then it can pick up noise. And if you really want to make it really hard to do, I've actually seen people put in radio signals into an analog input, and it really does mix up the start. But usually this is good enough for most things we need to do. So now... That takes care of random numbers. So that's what's involved in creating a random number on this board. And it looks like this board is freezing today on me, my picture, which is good because there's nothing to show, but it has frozen again. So just let me reset it one more time. It's there blinking. You gotta love technology some days. Today is not my day to be playing with this stuff, but it is. Okay. so that add the feature of timers we want to use a timer in here now timers are very handy for creating events that happen on either a regular basis or on a different basis and one of the things that we can do is we can actually look at the internal clock and there is an internal clock built into the processor so let's go back down to here or our main loop and I'm going to introduce a new line and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new variable called current time. And I'm going to make that equal to a function called mills. And that's what it's going to be equal to. And in fact, let's get the semicolon in there. So mills. And mills, what it is, it's an internal clock within the microprocessor itself. Arduino uses the term mills to access it, and it's a time in milliseconds. So then the next thing we're going to do here is I'm going to print this. So I'm going to just go to show you what it does. We're going to go serial print LN. And we're going to make that uh, current time. Now, there is one thing that's going to happen here is it's not going to be very happy doing this right now if I try to save this because I haven't defined current time. So we're going to come up here to our numbers. We're going to add in a new line, and we're going to add in a new type of variable. Now, random numbers are random numbers were done in long, which is signed 32-bit. So it uses positive and negative. Now, the difference is we're going to now use a number for the clock, and it uses 32 bits as well, but with no sign because it only counts in the positive direction. So what that does, instead of going to 2.4 billion, it actually goes to 4 point something billion. 
in order to get to its maximum number. So you actually have to create a variable that it understands, which is unsigned long for anything to do with the internal clock. So I'm just creating current time and I'm just making that match the data type that Mills is. So again, another built-in function, we just have to know it. Where did I find out this information? Well, it was pretty easy. I found it at the Arduino site. I go to the Arduino site. I go looking at the uh, reference material for it and you can look these up and it will tell you what type of information is available and what numbering systems they use. So let's save that. We'll open up our serial monitor again. And now we're gonna see a couple of numbers come by here. There we saw the number 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Oh, it's 5,001 now, 7,002, 7, 8,003. So you can see we're actually gaining, not only are we gaining the 1,000 for the delay, but we're gaining the odd millisecond in processing the program and sending it out to the receiver. But the large number is the internal clock. So it's the amount of time that's happened since its last restart in milliseconds. So it's been running for 30 seconds now, 31, 32, and so on. So it's pretty close to every one second. So you can see this is a close timer, it's not exact. Well, I want it to be better than this. I want this to be more accurate. Because of this delay, I'm actually creating a time in here and I'm actually adding a few milliseconds to my timer. Now this might not seem like a much unless you're trying to run a clock. If you're running a clock, adding a few milliseconds, even now I've added 26 milliseconds since we started this in one minute. If I take that over the course of a day, I'm gonna find that my clock is not gonna be at the right time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna modify this program here so it works based on time. We're gonna add a couple more things in here. So let's come back to this program and we're going to do a new thing here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this current time, I'm gonna cut it out of the program there because actually what I wanna do is I wanna throw it in here and I'm gonna make it part of that line. My random number generator, we can bring it up to the top. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in something new in place of serial print. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an if statement here. So I'm just gonna use my if, and I've already done this in the past, and I do this all the time with these things. So I'm gonna take if my current time is greater than my goal time, and these are gonna be new variables we're gonna to have to create. Then what I want it to do is I want it to execute something in here. And what I want it to do is I want it to print my current time, print my random time, but then I'm gonna to need to do one more thing here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add another line in here. And what I'm gonna to have to say is what goal time. I gotta set a new goal time so this does this once every second. Goal time equals current time. And this is going to be plus. And what I'm gonna say in here is delay time. So I've created more and more variables all the time. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna get rid of this delay. I don't need it anymore. So what I want this program to do is I want it to run as fast as it can. I'll let me create my other two variables I need in here. I created one called goal time and one created called delay time. And since we're counting in unsigned long, they're all gonna have to be unsigned long. Unsigned long, and this is gonna be goal time. And I don't have to give it a starting value. Unsigned long, and this one is going to be my delay time. And this one I am gonna make it equal to 1000 to be once every second. So I'm actually gonna set my timed value up here in the top now. So what I've done here is I've created the delay time. So I'm just gonna, I'm here at the bottom. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna upload this to the processor. And my screen froze again, closer than we were before. What we're seeing in here now is we're seeing an extra millisecond getting added onto every run. Well, very quickly, I could go in here and make a slight adjustment. Make that ever 99 milliseconds. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload that. 
we're going to go back into here and we're going to see if that makes a difference. And you can see now it's every second. And it started out with the one millisecond, which was the delay of going through this little first part of the code. But we can actually see in here that now we're staying one second apart. Every iteration is now exactly one second apart down to the millisecond. Every once in a while, we might gain a millisecond or lose a, we won't lose a millisecond, but we might gain one. So we've actually been able to use a timed function and been able to make it very accurate. We can fine tune it for our program as best as we can. And my 999 up here, it's right here, seems to fit pretty close to getting me on time. Will it vary slightly? Sure. But we can see we're creating new random numbers. If I press my button again, and we do that, we're going to see that we're going to get it. And it started with a new value. We'll do that another time here. What's the new value we get? We got an 8. We saw it worked on one millisecond up there, by the way. Press it again. We're going to see the 1 and then 79. So we've done it. But I do want to point out one last little thing about these random numbers to you. If you've noticed, 100 has never come up as a random number. I haven't seen 100. Oh, there's 0. That's interesting. So I am including the 0 that's in my code. The way this actually works with random number is it takes your minimum and it's your maximum minus one why they do that for sure, i think this is like a the end of a loop it says hey when you get to 100 start over again so it never actually uses 100 as one of your number generated so this actually generates from zero to 99 something you just need to know and it may not matter unless you happen to have ticket 100 you'll never win Okay, so just to let you know that 100 does not get included in your random number generator. But your timer works. So hopefully, this gives you a good example now of how the timer works within Arduino. So this is the random number generator. Uses random seed to create a, a variable starting point. It uses random to generate a number from the minimum to one less than the maximum. And we use timers in order to get a more predictable response from our program. It's more repeatable. So all of these things play into it. So let me show you now that we got by all of that. We're going to switch over to the CircuitPython version of this and show you some differences. And, and they are only minor differences. They're not huge. We're going to show you a couple things that happen in here. So let me just move this board out of the way. We're going to plug in the other board. And I'm going to plug it in. And we're going to go and we're going to turn off the Arduino window now. And we're going to open up Mu. So this is our editor we've been using with CircuitPython. Just makes it easier to use. And in here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here and I'm going to load in the file that's currently on here and we're going to see what that looks like. I'm in G. I'm going to load up my code PY file. I'm going to open that and it's going to pop up into here and because we're on the big screen, let me open this up to make it a little bit bigger. So what I got here, this is testing a feather M4 Express by me, random numbers and timers, include any helper files. We do have helper files. Unlike Arduino, it doesn't load in all the preset formulas. So this time we're going to only load in time and random. Those are the only two things we needed. And it says here, create any variables needed. This one I had to put in goal time. If you noticed, I put this in in a fraction. And delay time is also a fraction. I didn't have to include current time. Only goal time and delay time. So that's where a difference. I only needed to put in two variables here instead of three. In here, I don't define the data type at the beginning of this statement on lines 9 and 10. And the reason is in CircuitPython, it'll create the appropriate data type needed for where it's going in the program. I put in the point zero. I use the decimal here to tell me it's going to be a floating point number. And the reason for that is because when I get into the program, which this is the program here, 
there is no this this is basically there is no setup file so i don't have to open up the serial window i don't have to run random seed with this one what i get here is set the current time from the processor instead of calling it current time is equal to mills it's now equal to time dot monotonic and monotonic just grabs the internal clock random number just like the other one was is equal to random dot ran range range so what this is it uses the random function it turns it on uses it in memory only loads in the parts it needs and it uses a range from 0 to 100 in steps of 1 so this is random number from 0 to 99 so just like Arduino the second number is actually the number minus 1 is the maximum value so they do it the same way they do that exactly the same way down here if current time is greater than goal time there's my if statement print the random number and then goal time is equal to current time plus the delay time all the same things I just did in the Arduino program so they look the same print is doing it there I'm not printing out my times I'm just printing out my random number if we want to see what that looks like I open up the bottom here and I can actually see it and it's talking to the processor chip and you're seeing these numbers go by are we worried that we're going to start with the same number well let's see if I hit save it started with the number 10 okay let's see if I hit save again where does it start 34 if I do it again it's 75 now these look more random than what they were in the Arduino they really aren't they are not any more random than they were in the Arduino these are also pseudo pseudo random numbers just that they do a better job of picking a random place to start than the Arduino does so with Arduino we need to add random seed and connect it to an analog port an unused analog port preferably and we'll actually get a random number whereas in circuit Python just calling up random and using the rand range number you can do it now in Arduino I talked about you can go to something called uh, arduino.cc and look at the reference area and you can look at how all that references are used on their on their site to do it for circuit python if i want to know what's built in here and how random works because there's actually a lot of functions in random that are not available on arduino that are available in circuit python and you can learn about them on your own you go to something called read the docs and it's actually a file that connects you onto uh, a read the docs site and you go read the docs circuit python and just go to the newest one and these are part of the core and let me just show you that really quick so i'm going to open up a google window and i'm going to have to uh, see if this is going to be nice to me today nothing else has been so i don't know why it would be so right now none of that stuff is selected so let me just uh, go in here and add the source and I'm going to add my screen capture and I'm going to grab a window actually let's see if I can grab smart collection up here this is going to be really interesting and there it is look at this it's actually going to I'm going to make this nice and big and then I'll turn it back off afterwards so we can see there. But basically, I'm looking at my Google window here and I'm going to go for something called read the docs. And I'm going to make it all one word. And I'm going to put in circuit Python. Now, this one, luckily, I've done this one before. So that's up here. So it's read the docs, circuit Python, hit enter. And I'm just going to go to the very first listing, which is on readthedocs.org. And it's for circuit Python. And I just want to show you how to get into here. So there's something called read the docs. So this is kind of a neat little thing. I go to the latest. It's all laid out here. This is the circuit Python. And way up here on the top left under these, these are hard to read because you only got limited size to work with on this page. But it's called core modules. And if you click on the core modules, there's a whole long listing of things here. These are all built in functions. When we do time, for instance, if I scroll down here, and I look for T there's the time function that I keep adding as a helper file 
Well, you can click on that and it goes to the details. I'll click on random, which is up here. I'll click on random and it tells you that this is a pseudo random numbers and choices. So it's telling you that it's not a true random generator. And then down here are all the different commands that are available with it. There's random seed if we want to use random seed. And it actually gives you a, a random starting point just like it did before. Here's our random dot rand range, and range and here's where I used start, stop and the steps. And so that actually gave me those three things that I actually used in my program. There are other ones down here, along here, and they just return different choices. Uh, random, random is strictly a number between one and zero as a floating point. So it's gonna give you some sort of a decimal. It's predefined, you don't add maximums and minimums. And so on and so forth. So there's different functions that are available. I just wanted to make you aware of that. It's not something you're gonna use all the time, but this is where I get a lot of this information when I'm programming. Okay, so let's go back into this program a little bit more that it's running. We can see that it works fine. I'm going to go ahead and turn that serial point off because really that's all there was to this program. So when I, I gotta change things here, here we go. We can see the whole program here. It's relatively short, generates a number, and it does it with a timed function. So that all seems to work. So now what we're going to do is, because we're running a little bit later, I want to take some time because I want to go over the big board that I was showing you earlier. I want to show you that with some actual practical uses for this, especially for the model railroading people. You want to learn how to use this a little bit better? I'm going to try and make, make it go there. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to close this window. And it's not going to be happy when I close it, but we're going to go ahead and close it. I'm going to unplug that one. I'm going to bring in my big board now. And I'll zoom that back out. In fact, I probably have to zoom it out one more because I have all this other stuff hooked to it. So, what's going to happen here? This will probably mess up the eye for a moment. But let me show you some of the features that I have on this board. And I'll see if I can't fix it when I go into my zoom because I didn't fix it in this image, but I, I'll try. Okay, hopefully we're gonna be all right here. I'm, I'm hoping that our audio stays good for this. So what I have here is I have a few different things and I just wanna point them out here. I have a number of things connected already. First of all, I did connect two input push buttons. Those little black wires are in the way a little bit. Let me move those out. These are nothing more than simple push buttons, and they're connected to two of the yellow wires, and they give me two inputs into my board, and I'll explain for what, what that does, but I want two inputs coming into my program. Over here, I have two individual LEDs. These are going to represent street lights. So I could actually turn on a number of street lights on my layout with this, and I use the on and off for turning on my street lights. In here, I have a flashing red light. If you notice, it's flashing. This is a warning light, and it's flashing based on a time signal. Then I go in here to my next three LEDs. These three LEDs are a traffic light. I have my red, my yellow, and my green. So right now, the light is green, it looks white to you. If I shadow that, I'm sure they will look better. The focus is gonna go nuts trying to figure out what's going on. But we can see we have a red light on. They're actually a timed circuit. I think it's got about 16 seconds of red, about three seconds of yellow and 13 seconds of green. And of course you could have the other lights in there. So there's the green light for that direction. After a little while, it'll go to yellow and then it'll go to red. And then what I've added is something that's neat down here is I've got 10 different LEDs. These could represent 10 different buildings and these are all tied to different inputs on this board. I said this board was just an expanded version of the Uno. It's a much larger board. It's based off the same design as an Uno. Uh, this is the CircuitPython version. So this is the same as the Metro M0, or actually it'd be the Metro 328 would be the Arduino version. The M0 would be the smaller board, same size as an Uno. This is an M4 chip. So this is a big, expense, extensive one. This thing has over 50 inputs in it inputs and output pins. 
This has a huge number of I.O. compared to the Uno. So that's why we're going to use it. So let's go back to our main because I'm going to load in this program and you're going to see what's going on. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to go back to main. Our audio should stay. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to load up this file. And I'm going to go in here, take code PY, and I'm going to open it. It says it already exists, but it really doesn't. We're going to try that again. I just had to get rid of it. And here it is here. So now it's read what's on that chip. Unlike the Arduino, the Arduino, we can't pull it off of the chip. This one I can. I have this file saved up there too, but I just wanted to pull it directly off the chip. So I'm going to show you what's going on inside this chip to show you the different things that happen here. So this is street, light, street lighting test using Grand Central M4 by me, and it's CircuitPython 5.3.0. When I started out doing this series, we were at 5.0.0. Now we're at 5.3.0. So in here, I've got all my helper files. So I've connected the board, the bus IO, the digital IO, the time, and the random are all here. So not, And these are all internal files. These are You don't have to add any extra files to the library. These are just internal files it needs. Pin assignments. I have a few extra pin assignments here. The first thing I did, and we'll talk about this on another show, is I'm gonna, I assigned to assign my input pins. So I assigned switch, and it says day night is what DN stands for. Uh, it's just my own terminology. Switch DN1 and switch DN2. They're connected to pins eight and nine on the board. They are set for a direction as an input. And then they have something called input. They are referred to as a pull-up. And that's something we'll talk about on another show on how we set up push buttons properly. Because there's a number of ways you can set up a push button on one of these boards. Whether it be Arduino or CircuitPython. The building lights are a little bit easier to set up. But again, it's just an LED. B is for building. 53 is just my remembering where I connected it, and it's connected to pin 53. So you can see we have a lot more pins on here than what we had on the other one. And then we have pin 52, and then oh, then set for direction of output. Then we have 52, 51, we continue going down, and they go all the way down from 53 to 44. Those are my, those are all the pins that I have connected. I have 10 building lights connected at this point. I could do more, I could do less, this is just an example. The next section is my street lights. My street lights are connected to pins D7. That's the white lights here on the far right hand edge of the board. And they're just going to be on a little bit differently. I created a section for the warning light. The warning light is connected to D7. That's the one that's blinking on a time right there. And then I have my street, my traffic lights are connected to D6, D5, and D4. And that's my red, yellow, and green that I have connected here for my traffic light that would be simulated on the board. Now, all these individual LEDs, because they're LEDs, they all have their own resistors. This is really simple. This is just 220 ohm resistors. Nothing fancy here. And then I'm going to add some variables. Now, I had to add a fair number of variables in this one. So I had added current time. And in fact, let me just increase that just a little bit. Might make it a bit easier to read. Uh, there we go. Current time is set to 0, 0.00. Again, it's a floating point number. I want to make sure it's a floating point number. This is my step one, step two, step three. These are my traffic light times. So red cycle, green cycle, yellow cycle are set for 16, 13, and three seconds. And then I have next step. This is traffic light, traffic light step. It starts with step number one. Well, that makes sense. We want to have the red cycle first, and then we move on to the other two, two cycles. Warning light, goal time, and initial, and the interval time. So this is like my delay. So while this is set for two and a quarter seconds, I can set it for whatever I want. But I did set that, that light is pulsing at a steady two and a quarter seconds. So that's how that's working there. Day night mode, I'm gonna set this night. Night is equal to uh, false. So when it's false, it's day. And when it's true, in other words, uh, when this value changes to true, it will become night. The street lights start out as false, meaning they're off. Uh, street light number starts out as a zero, so that's a that's a variable I wanted. Time random, 
time on delay, time on delay set, time off delay, and time off delay set. These are all variables used in my random number generators that I'm using here. So now we get into the big part of the program. So let me go through what's in the big part of the program here. First thing I do is the same thing that I did before, is I look at it and grab the current time from the processor. Because this is circuit of Python, it grabs it as a flowing point number from seconds and then down into millis and nanos and so on and so forth into microseconds and everything else. In here, as I actually, this is my traffic light control. So if current time is greater than the traffic light next step, then I go through. And what I do in this, in every case, is when a step is reached, I have an if statement within an if. So if it's equal to step one currently, I want to set LED 6 to true, which is my red light, turn off the yellow and turn off the green. And then it adds the new, the new delay time and tells it what step is next. And then it goes through for the green light, for the amber light. In each case, it just sets which one's on, which two are off. It doesn't do anything fancier than that. Pretty straightforward. The warning light is another one. The warning light here is just an if statement. Again, we have a goal time. It has its own initial initiating time. That's that, how often do I want it to happen? That's that two and a quarter seconds. So it comes in here, it turns it on, and exactly 50 milliseconds later, it turns it off. So that light is on for a whole 50 milliseconds when it's blinking. And of course I can change that time a little bit. And then I just set a new base time based on that current time. So every two and a quarter seconds, this is happening. Set to night, set to day, is just where I turn around and I set to set tonight by pressing switch one and I use switch two to set it to day mode. So all it does is set the modes here. What happens here is I set my street lights to false when I'm going to day mode. I want to turn off my street lights, which makes sense. But when I'm in night mode, they're going to turn on. And basically it says here, if not day night mode, in other words, we don't do that and we don't have the street lights on, turn them on. But once they're turned on, it leaves them turned on. It doesn't go back and do this again. It doesn't have to go through every loop and turn the lights on again. It does it once when you first go into night mode. Then what comes in is the hard part of all this. So I'm going to have to zoom out just slightly so you can see the end of this. And this is in while in night mode. If not daytime on set, street lights random. What's going to happen here is my street light number, it's going to generate a number from 0 to 9. Again, it's not going to go to 10, it's 0 to 9. I have 10, I have 10 uh, numbers that I'm actually producing in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have here, is I'm going to have my random range from 0 to 4 is what I've shortened it to. And I have a straight number, and it's going to tell me the random, so it's going to give me feedback, and it's going to set it. And then basically what's going to happen, it's going to turn these lights on in random order. And basically that's what I want to have, is I want to have all of these lights come on in random order. And these are actually all the building lights because it's LED building, LED building, LED building. So this is my 44 to 53, my 10 LEDs. Then what I do is I come down here and if we're in day mode, I want to sure, make sure that my all my other lights are off and now we start going through this setting and we're going to turn them off in random order. And that's everything. So let's see what happens in the actual board now. I'm going to press it in here. My street lights came on right away. And what's happening over here is if I shadow that, we'll see different lights are coming on at different times. And it's not going to be any pattern to it. If I want to see what that pattern is, I can open up the serial interface. And it's going to be telling me what's going on on this serial interface. In fact, I can make that a little bigger now. It's going to tell me which light and how many seconds. So this is going to be light three and one, eight in one second, and so on. It's going to turn them on. I've already told that in there. We can see that there's a couple off in the middle towards the right-hand side. It actually goes from zero to nine the way that you're looking at it. So that would be, uh, what is that? Is that zero to nine or is that one to three? No, that looks like zero to nine. Oh, one left. There's still one that's off missing in here. It's hard to see, but there is one that's off in there. And basically we keep scrolling. Now we do repeat numbers and that's okay because that adds a certain amount of randomness to it. And eventually 
Make sure that's not just a bad connection. No, nope, we're waiting for that one there. And I believe that's seven. I haven't seen seven come up on here yet. So if we wait long enough, I went with a fairly quick. In the meantime, you'll know my warning light is still operating and my street lights are on. Oh, it looks like they've all made it now. So it must have scrolled by. Oh, there was a seven there. When I go to go to day mode, my street lights shut off right away. Now these will start turning off in random order. What this does, it gives me a little bit of the sense that the buildings are being turned on and off while it's people coming in and going home, going to bed, getting up, going to work, turning off their lights as they're leaving in the morning. So I can have businesses turn on and off their lights accordingly. Now I can make this, oh, and see now they're all off. I can set these intervals a lot longer. When I originally wrote this, I had a light coming on about once every 30 seconds. So it could take as little as five minutes for all the lights to come on or more typically it took about 25 minutes before we happen to randomize and get all of our lights on and for turning them off I used to have it do it a little bit sooner and you could make this more complicated time it with your fast clock if you're running a fast clock on your train layout so and maybe only certain ones are turned off at night some of them aren't or some of them are skipped and the same thing goes with uh, turning them back on at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the morning for people getting up to go to work. And when you go to day mode, they all start shutting off again. So you can actually create a bit of randomness on your layout so people don't know when lights are going to go on and off. Not even you. Again, we can turn them on. I don't have to wait for all of these lights to light up. I have currently four of them lit up, now five. I can start turning them off now. And they're just going to turn off random. So it may take a while for all of them to shut off. So that's just something that we can do with the light. So that just gives us an idea of where this can be. So I hope this is helpful. This is a fairly long program if you want more information on it. Um, you can scroll back through your video. And you can definitely go up here and look. And look at this code in more detail. I would say that uh, the best way to do this is try it try creating a few things add a couple of uh, lights see what happens see if it's working well for you and play around with it and learn how to use these features random numbers are kind of a neat thing to do if anybody ever did the magic eight ball or the uh, you know what does the wizard say when you put your coin in the uh, gives you a uh, you know here's your future it gives you a little slip of paper it's a random printout or it's a random some message that it sends you. This is how it's done. We use these types of things all the time and we just use whatever we want to trigger it, whether it be time or a push button. You know, if we can make it predictable, then it's not very good. If it's random, remember it is only pseudo random on microcontrollers. It looks pretty good and it makes people wonder, wow, how did that ever happen? You could use that for your guests, have that running and have them press. And if they're coming in, I know that a few of us that operate, we go to operating layouts. One of the worst things that happen is there's six operators there and there's six jobs to do. And everybody's either run everything at some point or another, or they don't care what they run. You could use a random board, have them press a button and it would pull up a number. Whatever job number it is, that's the one you get. So you could use that to select your your uh, operations for the night. Who who gets to start with what train? So there you go. I hope you've enjoyed this. This was uh, microcontrollers with Kinger North. This was random numbers and timers with CircuitPython and Arduino. We're learning some of the new features that are going out here and uh, we're getting better with uh, what we see out here. So we're playing around with new items. I have a new overhead display that I was trying this week. Obviously, I had to fix a few things that I wasn't aware of. So the audio was a little shaky at the beginning. I hope it improved for you today. So don't forget, if you enjoyed this, please set a like to it. If you want to see more about this type of things, 
Make sure that uh, you find out when I'm broadcasting. Follow me on Twitter. My handle there is at Kinger North. Or subscribe to YouTube at youtube.com slash Kinger North. And we'll get notices. If you set up your notices, you'll get notices when I post up for my next live show. Everything being equal, I should have another live show next Saturday. We're going to talk more about topics next week. And I think I'm going to talk about it because we're starting to talk different input devices. We're looking at different output devices. So I think what I'm going to do is we're going to have another look at a, we're going to have a look at fancier output devices next week. I think we're going to have a look at LCD screens. So if you want to come in here and see how to display information out on a screen, come back next week. Until then, have uh, yourself a good time. Play with the electronics. Give it a try. That's the only way you'll know for sure whether or not it works. Until then, take care.